Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon by Dr. Bill Waddell is in Luke chapter 8, A Personal Salvation. Mark chapter 5 is where we're going to be this morning in our scriptures. We are, um, of course, in the book of Luke, but I want us to go back over this lesson that we learned last time, the story of the woman with a uh, 12-year bleeding problem. I cannot think of a more personal story than that. How would you like for your story of your personal illness to be plastered in the Bible uh, like that? She's in heaven today. Not sorry at all that we're gaining spiritual riches from, from her story. And, um, you know, if, if all of our stories were plastered out there, I mean, who knows? But, but God chooses what he does, and he uses uh, who he chooses. And so we are going to consider her story one more time. And again, just, the, just the, the important lessons that come off of this story, come out of this story, and how they apply to us. And, and uh, the, the, as we learned last time, how personal not only the story is for her, but how personal it is to God. And we learn more about our relationship with him through, through the story. So let's look together. We're Mark chapter 5. This is just, uh, we looked at Luke's uh, version of it. And not to say that there are, they are not conflicting versions. It's just that some writers add more, take away more. Luke has some things that he adds. Mark has some things that he adds. And it adds to the richness of of the flavor of the story. Let's back up to verse 25, Mark chapter 5. So Jesus has taken off to go heal this little girl and that's about to die. And on the way, this woman, it says, who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. And after hearing about Jesus, came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak. And then we learn why she does this, because she's been, she's been counseling herself prior to this. Here's what she had been saying up to that point. She thought, if I just touch his garments, I shall get well. And I told you last time, this, that whole phrase is, is in the imperative, it's, I mean, it's in the, in the imperfect in the Greek, which means she's repeating this to herself over and over and over again. She, she, she's, she's been restricted from any kind of community whatsoever. Anybody been through any kind of uh, COVID uh, um, isolation uh, no, it'd be too, pretty tough. We were two weeks together, my wife and I. Not, I mean, we have a great relationship, and, and we live in a great place. We have a great view, and we live down here in South Padre. Half of you all would like to live here, too. And, you know, too bad for you. We do, but you don't. And, uh, but two weeks stuck in one place, even with all that, is, man, you get kind of stir-crazy. Well, guys, this woman has been in, in uh, isolation for 12 years. She has not had human touch for 12 years. She can't see her family, her kids, husband, mother, the father, friends. You think a couple of months is bad? Think a couple of weeks are bad? We've been 10 months in this whole COVID thing. Let me tell you something. This woman can tell you a story of what it means to be isolated. And so to get herself into it, by the way, illegally, she shouldn't be there. Illegally into a crowd to, for the hope of healing, she's got to repeat this mantra to herself. If I can only touch his cloak, if I can only touch his cloak, if I can only touch his cloak. That's exactly the, that's what the imperfect implies here. She's repeating this to herself over and over and over again. And immediately as she touches him, the blood, her flow was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Like I said, it's extremely personal. So we're, we're, we know her personal disease and now we're hearing what's going on in her heart. I mean, she knows it's like we're, we're getting this insight into this, into this, uh, human being that we otherwise would have known nothing, nothing about. But now let's notice we're not only going to get the in, insight into the, what's going on inside of her, we're going to get the insight of what's going on inside of our Savior, even more importantly. You're familiar with your own thoughts. You're familiar with your own issues and problems. And not unlike hers, you know, and, you know we kind of all think the same. But do you know your Savior? Man, do you need to know him? Here we go. Look how personal. Immediately Jesus perceiving in himself. Like I said, this is one of the rare occasions you get a view of inside of God, what really God is doing. We see the outside, we see his commandments, we see how his, his effects, but what is he really thinking? How is he really feeling? Here we go. Perceiving in himself that power proceeding from him and had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And I said that we know Peter said this, even though it just says his disciples you see the multitudes pressing in on you and you say, who touched me? And how can you possibly pick one person out of the thousands who are just grabbing at him and screaming at him and falling down in front of him and all the things that happen to him every single day? He looked around to see the woman who had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well, literally saved you is what the word, word is literally in Greek. Go in peace. Jesus doesn't throw that word out very easily, I would suggest to you. Go in peace. 
and be healed of your affliction. Wow, what a powerful, powerful story. Uh, so super personal, and yet here so incredibly public. And we need, as we said last time, this personal relationship with Jesus. So what good would have done this woman if she knew that Jesus could heal her, but she never came to him? Yeah, well, what good of all the testimonies that she hears of all the people who had been healed by him? And these people just throng and, you know, cl clamoring to get at him, bringing their daughters to him, their wives, their children, themselves. She hears all their testimonies. Every person that gets near him, every person that Jesus sees, they're, they're healed. They've never seen anything like this. So what good does it do to know those stories if she doesn't come to Jesus? You see what I'm saying? She has to personally come to him. The underscore of this whole story is you have to have a personal, oh, hey, great, you know he's the Savior. Awesome. He saved all the people you know. Great. What's keeping you out of hell? Let me say, let me, let me, let me pull out from under you things that may comfort you. I've been a Baptist all my life. I can't believe you're talking like that. Well, how, how would being a Baptist have helped this woman? Tell me. Well, I've been in church and I've been a good person. Awesome. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not chiding those things. I'm just saying it wouldn't help her one iota. She had to personally come to a Savior. I don't care what name you put out there. I've been a Baptist. I've been a Presbyterian. I've been a Methodist. I've been this. I've been that. Great. whoop de doo though. You have to personally come to the Savior, who's not a Baptist, not a Methodist, not a Presbyterian, not any of these things. He is the ultimate, incredible Savior. We have to have a personal relationship to him, with him. And notice, as in, in the case of this woman, so is in the case of every one of us. You have to have a personal relationship with him, and it affects him personally. Salvation comes from him personally. It's not some intermediary. It's not magic dust. It's not being, as I said last time, dispensed from this uh, celestial water cooler and handed out by angels. No, it's from him. You deal with him personally. Have you had a personal encounter with the Savior in which you have placed your faith in him? Don't tell me what you've done and who you are. Tell me how it would have been different from this woman by the things that you're saying. It would have been no different. She had to come to him personally. It affects him, notice, Jesus, it affects him personally. It's from him personally. It moves him personally. When we come to him, it's him personally. And likewise, as in the case of this woman, him personally saying to you, go in peace, your faith has saved you. Those are the words you want to hear. What matter more than anything in this whole world. You have to have Jesus as your personal Savior and your salvation affects him personally. So I want to do this Sunday... Add kind of a, just an addendum to the things that we've been talking about in, the, in that way. And I want to magnify more on this whole issue of your personal relationship with him. So I have to come to him personally to be saved. But I also have to remain with him personally in order to have my life cleaned up. So I'm saved, I'm reconciled to God, and everything is right. Everything's going to be great for me in heaven. But why does God leave me here? Because I have a responsibility. I have a testimony. Now I know a Savior. Now I'm responsible to introduce you or anyone else to the Savior that I know. And the first introduction that I have with them is my own personal life, the decisions that I make, the things that I say, the places that I go, the, decision, the, the things that I do with myself. How do I change that lost habits and those lost lifestyles and the things that I see in my world into a, a life that demonstrates that I'm a, a person who knows Jesus? Well, it's required of me to, have, to, to maintain this personal relationship. To maintain it, in fact, that's the key. The key to overcoming, listen, sin and living life that is a pleasing to God is that relationship. It's the key to, to your salvation. It's the key to your sanctification. God has saved you. you got a home in heaven. Now he's required you to be sanctified. That relationship is the key to it. Uh, ever wonder why some people, believers, go seemingly to the heights of holy living and others or maybe, maybe you see it in, in, in their lives. So in one case, they've been living as Christians but not doing very well as Christians in a personal walk. And then all of a sudden, their life completely changes and they, they really uh, turn on, if you will, with God. And, and they, they just make a huge difference and it's, their life is just night and day different. What, what's the difference there? Or, or, or two Christians, one's sort of mediocre and the other one just seems to go, like I said, to the heights of holiness and, and uh, personal sacrifice. What's the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is. The difference is not salvation. The difference is what they focus on, that personal relationship. One is giving everything to that personal relationship. It's going to be reflected in their life. The other is not giving so much. So guess what? They ain't getting so much. It's reflected in that way. The scriptures make it very clear. You say to me, you have a problem with, your, with that relationship. You, 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 you aren't near what, as obedient as you thought you should be or, or once were. You aren't happy to serve and give all to God as you think you should be, as you knew you once were. I'll tell you what your problem is. 
It is an obedience problem. But focusing on that obedience problem won't fix it. What you really have is a love problem. I want you to notice, we're going to put it on the screen for you here. Notice the relationship that Jesus draws between obedience and love. You can't separate them. Again, watch Jesus here. John 14. The one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. How do you know the people that love Jesus? Jesus tells you right there. So I got a person that's not obeying his commandments but tells me he's loved Jesus. I'd say, no, you don't. I'm not saying you're not saved. Maybe you're not. Maybe you should question your own salvation. But maybe it's possible that you are indeed saved, but you're doing nothing with that relationship. It's reflecting in your life, isn't it? Jesus says it will. He keeps my commandments. This is how you're going to know them. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will reveal myself to him. Notice the, the, the relationship between love and obedience. Again, a couple of verses later. If anyone loves me, he will follow my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. That's very personal, isn't it? See, it's all about that personal relationship. You've got to come to Jesus personally to be saved. You also have to remain with Jesus personally in order to be sanctified. You having a problem with obedience? I'm telling you, it's not an obedience problem. It's a love problem. It's a love problem. Again, John 15, Jesus, again, if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Here you go again, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God. Notice the emphasis here. Love, 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 love that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Oh, yeah, they are. You try to keep them? They're pretty tough. In fact, if we're talking here about uh, the, the fact that you're not obeying, it's, because, it's not because you're not trying, it's because you can't do it. They indeed are burdensome. But hear me carefully. Not if you love him. Not if you have a close relationship with him. See, the key here is they're only burdensome for those that love him. If your relationship is on the wane with him, I'm telling you, they're going to be burdensome. It's going to be rough. It's going to be rough. Again, John, 2 John 6. And this is love that we walk, here it is again, in obedience to his commandments. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that we walk in love. That says it all. That says it all. It's that relationship, abiding in that love relationship with the Savior that will solve, listen to me, a sin habit. Well, obedience problem. And don't get the order wrong here. When we love... Obedience is the consequence. It's what flows out of that relationship. And when I don't obey, it tells me very immediately I've got a love problem. I've got a relationship problem. I need to fix that relationship. Not try harder. Not, there's nothing wrong with trying. Listen to me. But it won't solve your problem. Because you don't have it. Jesus died on the cross because you don't have it. You can't obey. He can obey through you, but you've got to be near him for that to happen. You remain in my commandments, you will remain in my love. It's like a flashlight shining on the floor. So I got the flashlight, the light's always on because Jesus loves me. But I may be over there. I'm not in the light. Not because he doesn't love me, not because the light's not on. That's not the problem. I'm just not in it. I've got to obey, you see. I've got to come to him. I've got to, have that. I've got to be close to him in order for that relationship to, to come together. Love solves the other commandments. You know what the greatest commandment is? Remember what it is? What is it? Love Love, isn't it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This, Jesus says, is the greatest commandment. Why? Because it solves all the other ones. It's the solution. Because as I love God, I naturally am going to keep, I shouldn't say naturally, I'm supernaturally, because God's love's flowing through me, I'm going to keep these other commandments. But listen, if I leave that one out and try to keep those other commandments, I'm going to not obey either one of them or any of them. Because I don't have the power within myself. It comes from the relationship. Stop focusing, listening, on obedience and start focusing on loving him. That focus will change you, not your determination to do better. Again, that focus on love will change you, not your determination to do better. Think about it. How, many, how often have you been determined to do what's right and still didn't? Yeah, I know how you feel. That love relationship secures that. Tell you a story, my personal experience. A love I fell into when I was 20 years old uh, turned out to be my wife eventually. First date I had with her, I was love struck with her. I told you a story. I haven't. I mean, I truly, like I, I went out with her knowing I was going to marry her. I, mean, I didn't tell her that. I wanted to. I wasn't. I was dumb, but I wasn't that dumb, you know. 
And, um, and, and then you've, you, I don't know if you know that about me, but anyway, that's just, just absolutely love struck with her. Still am, 31 years later. But, but um, I'm also a red-blooded American redneck. I like hunting, I like fishing, I like outdoors. I disdain all forms of shopping, like all real men. <laughs> and the worst place to me in any shopping area is the women's section of the shopping area. And I don't know what it was, probably because I was drugged there by moms and grand, grandmothers and aunts and stuff like that. But I just absolutely just, you know, a fate worse than death is to be caught over there uh, all, the, all the women's apparel. Well, listen to me. Two months in a relationship with my wife. Guess where I am? <laughs> Sitting outside a women's ladies changing area by myself. She's inside changing the clothes. Right next to me, I mean... Touching me is women's undergarments, <laughs> and I'm holding her purse, looking like a <laughs> pervert. And I was sitting thinking to myself, what has happened to me? I never saw myself in, in this situation. I'll tell you what happened to me. Love changed me. Love completely changed me. Stuff I would have never done. You'd never seen me there. You'd never caught me there. You know, I would have, you know, if, if there was a reason to burn any place down, I'd have burned that place down. I don't have nothing, no use for that stuff, not whatsoever. But, but listen, love will change you. Love will make you what you could never have been by yourself. Love will make you go places, do things, be the person that you could have never been. I didn't have to counsel myself on, okay, Bill, you're going to get over this whole women's apparel stuff. You're going to go shopping because... You just have to. I didn't have to sit down and coach myself, uh, force myself, if you will, into, into following a set of rules. I naturally did it because it came out of the relationship. Do you see? Out of love. Love will change you. Far more than your determination to do what's right. Far more. If your Christian life is suffering, listen to me. You have an, having an obedience problem. The solution is not to try harder. It's to love more. The solution is not to try harder. It is to love more. Your obedience will flow from the love of that relationship or your disobedience will flow from the lack thereof. No way around it. No way around it. In his book, The Obedience Option, uh, David Hay, Christian counselor, was having this conversation with a young man who was having a sin issue. He was just caught up in this sin. He couldn't get away. He said, you don't understand. It's just, it just overwhelms me. I can't stop it. I can't get past it. I can't get over it. It's no, you can't stop it. I've just given in to it. I, I know it's wrong. I don't want it. I, I can say right now, I don't want to go, go, go and be a part of that. But he says, I'll fall right back into it again. There's no way to stop it. So I've just given up trying. He says, so let me tell you something then. Let me, let me ask you this question. So let's say I, I'm, I'm near you at some point when you're being tempted and you're about to fall into this sin, which you say you can't stop. You say it has power over you and you can't control it. And let's say I pull out $1,000 and I say, if you don't do this sin, I'll give you this $1,000. He said, what would you do? I said, well, I'll take the $1,000. He said, I don't have to, I can, I can delay it. You know, it's no big deal. He says, so I thought you couldn't control it. I thought you couldn't stop it. And this was his conclusion. This is what he writes in his book, among other things. He says, one passion may seem irresistible until a greater passion comes along. Just the facts. Love will change you. Your passions change. You say, well, I, I can't stop doing that. Well, you've got a passion problem. You've got a love problem, which results in an obedience problem. It does. Like any relationship, your love level is affected by your knowledge level. So as you come to know each other, you come to understand better. I don't do a lot of things, do a lot of things, a lot of places because of what I know my wife. I mean, it's, I restrict myself. Why? Because I love her. I absolutely love her. And if I was all by myself, yeah, I would be a slob. And I'd be fishing every single day. <laughs> but I'm neither, for more or less, neither one of those things because my wife is in my life. I'm a lot of, I could be a lot of things outside of Christ, a lot of things outside of my relationship with Christ. I'm capable of all kinds of weird and bad stuff, just like you. But in that relationship that I have with him, that love relationship, maintaining it is what keeps me from those proclivities. The only thing that does, not my determination to do better, never has, never will. Knowledge, likewise, of our Savior and knowledge of ourselves in that relationship is huge. It's huge. Jesus tells the story, or he gives the illustration and tells the story in the midst of it. He's invited over at one of these occasions on a Sabbath day to one of the Pharisees' homes, a guy by the name of Simon. He goes over there, and he's eating Sabbath meal. 
You know the story. In comes this woman of ill repute. She doesn't say anything. She just kneels down at his feet, which are stretched out behind him, and she begins to weep and wet his feet with her tears and dry it with her hair. Personal, right? Yeah, it's real personal. Everybody in the room knows who she is, especially Jesus. Simon is over there thinking because he's a self-righteous dude. This man doesn't know who this woman is. If he knew, he wouldn't let her do what she's doing. She proceeds to pour oil right, and perfume on his feet. Jesus finishes his meal. He turns to Simon. He says, do you see this woman? Of course she does. I mean, this is like the spe- elephant in the room, you know, in every, every sense. Of course he does. He said, when I came into your house, you offered me no kiss. It was absolutely customary among men. You didn't do that. See, he had Jesus over just to, because he wanted to catch him. He didn't like Jesus at all. He says, you offered me no kiss when I came. It was customary. It was expected. He didn't do it. You offered me no water for my feet. Customary. Expected. No oil for my head. Customary. It was expected. He said, but since I've been in here, this woman hasn't ceased to wet my feet with her tears, wipe my feet with her hair, and anoint my feet with this perfume. He says, Simon, I want to tell you a story. He goes on to tell him this story about these two guys that were in debt to this one creditor. One over 500 500 denarii, 500 days labor charges, basically. The other guy owed 50. The creditor called him in and says, listen, I'm going to forgive you both of your debts. 500 for you, 50 for you. He says, Simon, tell me, when that was over, which one of these guys loved the creditor more? Simon says, I guess it was the guy who you get, he forgave the most. He says, you said correctly. This woman has great sense, but her faith has saved her, changed her. He says this, this in conclusion. Notice here, Luke 7. He says, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Notice, for she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. So you tell me you have a love problem or you have an obedience problem, and I already told you it's a love problem. So, so could it be possible that you have a poor knowledge of who you really are or were as a sinner? Have you forgotten the wretch that you were? Yeah, I was saved when I was eight years old, but I was still a wretch. Have you forgotten? You see, there's a huge problem when it comes to knowledge. If we forget who we were, we'll forget who we are. And we're going to have an obedience problem as a result of it. A lot of Christians who have been a Christian for a very long time have a mediocre Christian lifestyle because they don't think they were that bad. They've forgotten. A knowledge problem leads to a love problem, which leads to an obedience problem. You have an obedience problem? Maybe it starts with your knowledge. Here's some suggestions for you. Have a personal review of your sins. Done that lately? And I would encourage you to remind yourself as you review those sins that every one of them was your ticket to hell. Oh, well, that'll depress me. Well, maybe you need a little of that. Maybe you need to be head over the head. I know I do sometimes. Pretty hard, in fact. Review what God's position is on sin. Learn what you had coming to you. Remember what Jesus' sufferings. Read it until it makes you cry. Until you realize how great he's, how much he's done for you. And, and, and there is no such thing as little sins. Forgiven little. So Simon was thinking, I don't have much going on with me, therefore I don't care much about you, Jesus. That's just the way it works. See, it's natural. Since I don't really know who I am, I don't really know who Jesus is, that results in a lack of love, which is in a lack of obedience. It's all tied together. Your obedience level is affected by your love level. Your love level is affected by your knowledge level. It just is. Tell me you have a love problem, I'm going to tell you you have an obedience problem, I'll tell you you have a love problem, which is related to a knowledge problem. Knowledge of yourself, knowledge of God. You forget why God loves you to begin with? I said, if we get to the place where, of course God loves me, I'm awesome, right? I've not been forgiven much. He wouldn't, he's having a hard time loving this woman, but he's not having a hard time loving me because I'm just amazing. Of course, heaven's going to be great when I get there because I want to make it just that much better. You don't know much about yourself. You don't know much about God. The Bible tells us God loved you when you were a complete wretch. God loved you when you were his enemy. So now that you're his child, how does he feel about you? Remember what 5.8 says here, Romans? But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
his initial act of love towards you was when you were completely unlovable. Not a single reason did he find within you to love you. He found the reason within himself because he's your creator. Because he decided to love you, you could have decided the other way too. But he decided to love you and he sent Jesus to demonstrate that love to you even though you would have nothing to do with him, care nothing about him, ask, didn't ask Jesus to come at all. He loved you like that when you were a sinner, so how does he feel about you now when you're a child? Man. See, have you forgotten that? If he can, if he can love you that much when you were that far from him, how does he love you now when you're this close to him? See, if anything, he loves you more. Child of God, right? Your attitude, listen, his attitude toward you is based on that love relationship and not your obedience. It wasn't then, was it? You were completely disobedient and lost and cared nothing about him. He loved you even then. So, so even today, his relationship with you or his attitude toward you is not based on, is based on that love, love relationship. It's not on your obedience. It's not. I read a story of a pastor how he came to the realization, of course, he preaches all the time. He says, I, I preach all the time, but I never did get it in my head. And he said, I had an experience. He said, when my daughter, our daughter was three years old, she was a part of a children's ministry in our church, and there was 30-something kids, and, and they were going to have a Christmas program. I don't know if you've ever been to a Christmas concert or anything, anything done by three-year-olds, but it's, it, it's not, um, well, it's not the Philharmonic Orchestra, let's just say that. It's just going to be something different. He said, sure enough, I mean, the woman had, it took her, it took her 20 minutes just to get the kids up on stage and get them up on the little risers that they were on. She said, because they're three-year-olds. They're, they're, they're problems. I mean, God bless the woman. She by herself handling 30 kids. So just the fact that she got up on the stage, he said, was pretty entertaining. He said, then she gets down here on a, on a guitar. She said, the woman couldn't sing to save her life. But she loved these kids, and she's going to play this guitar, and she begins to sing Joy to the World's Christmas concert. And the kids are kind of, you know, humming and saying a few words here and there. And they're basically just looking around at stuff and poking each other, waving at their parents. You know, and talking, and she said about, uh, about, about a third of the way into the second verse, a boy on the top of the riser started falling backwards, so he grabs the two kids on both sides of him, and then they grab the two kids on either side of them, and about five or six of them fall off the back. The woman, she said, just keeps playing. you got to get to the end of this, because they'll all be off of there before too long. They're talking, they're crying, they're singing, they're mumbling. He says, these are kids, they can't even speak in full sentences. So they're going to sing this amazing hymn. He said, by the way, the auditorium is completely packed with parents and grandparents. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of camera gear out here. Everybody flashing and filming and everyone with a smile. And he says, when it was all over, guess what we did? We all stood and applauded. And he said, we weren't faking it. We felt it. He said, I was so excited to see my daughter up there. It was just amazing. He said, it was just overwhelming. And he says, later on, a couple of days later, he said, I was reflecting on the whole thing. I was thinking, you know, in the order of concerts that he's been to, he says, it was horrible. There was nothing good about it. No one sang. No one did what they were supposed to. No one, no one, lots of, several people got injured. <laughs> he said, it was, it was though you wouldn't, he said, just in the, just, just an examination of it. He says, there's no reason we should have liked it. He says, why did we like this thing? Because that was our kids, he said. He said, I realized it. I realized, he says, I could preach it, I could tell others about it, but he said, I never could get it through to my heart that my, my, the God's attitude toward me has nothing to do with my obedience. It has everything to do with that relationship. He says, it's because I'm his kid that he loves me. It's because I'm his. See, if, if we don't know that, if, we, if we've forgotten that, when we get caught in this cycle of obedience, this cycle of oppression, oh, God's going to strike me dead. No, he would have already done it. He should have, but he didn't. Instead, he gave you his one and only son to rescue you, to bring you close to him. Personal relationship. And, and the ability through that personal relationship to be the person that you want to be but can't be any other way. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we reflect on our personal relationship with him. Do you know him personally? Have you come to him personally? Have you trusted him personally?
personally, you have to have a personal encounter with the Savior, you yourself. Not enough for this woman to know that Jesus could heal her. Not enough for you to know that Jesus can save you. You have to come to him for that salvation, and it affects him personally. It comes from him personally. Jesus, we thank you for this personal relationship that you offer freely to us, and that it's not just something that gets us a home in heaven, it's also something that gets us a different life, a better life, a real life. It's that love relationship that changes us. It's not our determination to do better. Surely compared to all the things that you want us to be or that we could be, it's, we're like three-year-olds in a concert. We, we don't have a lot to produce, can't show a lot. But we're so thankful that your attitude toward us is not based upon our obedience, it's based upon that relationship. Lord, help us to focus on what really matters, what really counts. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.